So we are here today at the Institute of Ecology with uh, Liliana and Raoul, and yes. we are about to interview the Dr. Uh, Elena Alvarez and talk about the situation of a GMO in Mexico. Well, I'm from Mexico. I'm a, a researcher in Mexico. I'm a scientist at the Institute of Ecology at UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, which is one of the important public universities in this country. And I'm a, a full professor here. I have a laboratory in molecular genetics, epigenetics, development and evolution in plants. And besides this very basic research work, which of course occupies a large portion of my time, I'm very worried about having interdisciplinary discussions with other scientists concerning some of the scientific and technological innovations and applications that can have important consequences for people in general, especially for sustainability, but also for the way the benefits and the risks of these developments are distributed among different parts of the society and among different groups of our society. It's generally the case that the benefits mainly go to the richest <laughs> and the risks and the problems and, and the um, dangers sometimes associated to some of these developments in a very unequal way, go more probably to the poor people, to the more, uh, I don't know, marginalized sectors of society. And so we're very worried about this because when I was growing up, my father was very enthusiastic about science. And besides being driven always by knowledge and, and by this basic value that should always drive science. He was also very enthusiastic about convincing us or sharing with us his conviction that science should be developed for making this world more uh, just, more fair, uh, more, uh, well, fairer, sorry, and also for developing um, technological applications that would enable us to have a much more sustainable way of producing food, for, for example. And nowadays, agricultural systems are one of the main sources of land destruction, of climate change. And so I think science has a very important challenge here. How do we produce enough food of high quality, adequate for the cultural diversity of the world, which we do not want to eradicate. And at the same time, we do this in a sufficient but sustainable way, avoiding the very large quantities of um, greenhouse effect gases that are nowadays being released into the environment by the industrial agriculture. So I'm very much uh, motivated by this um, challenge of science and so besides doing my basic work in molecular genetics and development and evolution which fascinates me I devote a lot of time especially thinking about how can we bridge between these traditional systems of food, food production like la milpa which is really a very uh, right, I would say, a very complete, sustainable, uh, civilizatory proposal, which implies not only multi-cropping, but many other aspects, with some of the best aspects of the contemporary science to provide our society uh, uh, some uh, innovations and means of production that make this world more uh, just in terms of uh, the social distribution of the benefits and the risks, but also more sustainable. So that's what motivates me. Wow. A lot of things. 
so I, I don't know if you have now some specific questions or, yeah. or, or yeah, that's I enough. to <laughs> get back to the documentary. Okay. So that's a documentary published in 2008. Was the, your interview with Marie Monique in 2008 or earlier? It was a little bit earlier. I don't remember exactly the, the date, but I probably it was a year later. I mean earlier, before. So uh, uh, one year before the movie was the released, movie was yeah. more or less. So when you're being interviewed, um, you talk about the possible contamination mm -hmm. of the traditional corn. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to know is what is the situation now? Okay. Six or seven years after. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Well, as we predicted, as Ignacio Chapella published in 2001. These uh, recombinant uh, constructions made in the laboratory of the main companies that want to control seeds and food production in the world uh, have reached the genomes of several native varieties. So we do have now the presence of these recombinant um, uh, uh, sequences, which are called in a very generic manner transgenes, we have definitely demonstrated that these have made their way into the genomes, which is the, the, the whole of the hereditary material of these land races in Mexico. And this has happened for maize, and it has happened also for cotton, which was yeah. also um, was also domesticated and diversi has diversified since its domestication in Mexico. And uh, so this is worrying, because despite the fact that the biology, the common sense, the modeling, the publications in the uh, probably one of the most important scientific journals in the world had already uh, acknowledged this, had already demonstrated this with a uh, uh, strong data and with the strong arguments. Many years ago, around 2000 and probably several years ago also in Mexico, there were several scientists here who were worried about this and who had already established this moratory because it was obvious given their experiments. People like Antonio Serratos, for example, was involved in this um, scientific committee in Mexico, had established this moratory for the release of this type of transgenic lines in the open field in Mexico. And despite the fact that the arguments were there, the scientific knowledge, both theoretical and empirical, was there. Even there was a publication, but there were some really strange things going around after this paper was published. And I think all these strange things that I'm just very colloquially putting them together as a strange uh, happenings are not uh, responding to any scientific value, really. Uh, well, have not been and, and were not at that point. But despite the fact all this was put uh, on place and was published and, and was acknowledged, and that would have been enough for the government of Mexico, that should have been enough for the government of Mexico to avoid further contamination and to establish the biomonitoring uh, techniques and programs to avoid this contamination of the Mexican maize. This has not happened. And one should ask why? Why? Why has the government, besides having this, this early data from Ignacio Chapella and then data from our lab, data from Antonio Serrato's lab and data from other places in the world demonstrating without any doubt that once you, once you release these transgenic plants into the environment, there's no way you're going to be able to restrict the movement of their genes via pollen and via seeds. Why, despite all this, the government hasn't done what it's necessary. It is it, the responsibility of this government uh, to do. 
the, the issues there are not scientific. So what do we have now in Mexico? We have um, scientifically documented presence of transgenes in several land races, in Veracruz, in Guanajuato, in Yucatan, in Oaxaca, of course, and this has been independently corroborated by several laboratories and, and, and various methods. And this was a place in Oaxaca and Puebla where Ignacio Chapela originally stated that he had found some transgenes. We know of other unpublished studies done by non-government organizations and by um, students who haven't published their thesis who have also recorded the presence of transgenes in some land races at the north of Mexico and in other areas like Puebla. And we are presently putting all these data together to, to provide the world with an updating of what's going on with this contamination that it's nowadays against the law because we have a law that should protect uh, not only maize but all the tens of species that were domesticated and diversified and continue to diversify in Mexico. So, said that, I think we are still in, in the moment in which this contamination and this accumulation of transgenes in the land races of Mexico can be reversed, can be controlled, can be avoided to some extent, but we need to work hard and we need to convince the world, the government, all the citizenship uh, in Mexico and elsewhere that this is a very important issue because if this contamination continues there will be a moment and I don't think it's going to be many years uh, apart from now when there will be no way back. There will be no way back to the original land races. Of course, when we talk about the original land races, we, we're we not talking about land races that are static. These land races are dynamic, but we want them dynamically adapting to the needs, to the conditions that are also dynamically changing, changing in the world and in the cultures, in the communities, both uh, mestizos and, and from uh, autochthonous communities or communities that were originally in this country before the Spaniards, uh, the, uh, the Spanish colonization. Uh, and, and so these cultural dynamics, environmental dynamics and genetic dynamics, the three of these types of dynamics are completely interlinked and feedbacking in complex ways to keep this marvelous diversity of, of genes, but on, not only of genes, of complexes of genes, of phenotypes, of forms, of races, of biorities. And this is what we want to maintain. And all of this is not private. This is a communal good uh, that has been produced by many, many, many cultures, many hands of peasants um, through millions of years. And having these transgenes, which have been privately developed, which are tags for eventually being able to sue the peasants if they have these uh, transgenes, these sequences, in enough frequencies, without them knowing, without them wanting them, without they being able to to avoid them. But if eventually the, these transgenes attain a certain frequency and the companies want to sue these peasants for using them without having the permits, they are, in principle, given the loss of patents uh, and, and, and the international regulations concerning intellectual protection, etc., etc., the companies could be able to sue the peasants. So this is one type of... Uh, 
modification of these traditional communal uh, dynamics uh, and, and, and way in which these um, seed stocks have been managed through millions, uh, through, through thousands of years. But another one is biological, and we know from an, our molecular genetic experiments that the accumulation of these transgenes without any control, and even one transgene could yield developmental alterations in, in maize that could alter their possibility of uh, regenerating these, these seed stocks. No? So that's why we're worried. And besides, I think, it is completely uh, unacceptable and undemocratic, non-democratic, to release such a, a technology without asking the, the users, the owners, well, they're not owners in a private way, but they are the communities, the cultures who, who are uh, taking care of this communal resource which I think it's fundamental for the future of food security in the whole world. And without being consulted, without their consentment, without them knowing about it, um, they're being um, introduced or contaminated into their seed stocks. And so besides all the biological, economic, uh, unwanted consequences of this transient flow, there is the very basic ethical issue about why the people who have been inheriting these seed stocks for many generations and who have these seeds as their main source, not only of food, but at the heart of their cultures, why should they accept or why should they start to have these types of transgenes in their seed stocks without being consulted. Well, so I guess well. we, that confirms that the situation is alarming, that the science has proven that uh, this is wrong, this is criminal, and we now know that it's up to the ends of governments. Um, so that, what you said, answered quite a few of my questions, I think. Yes. Also mine, <laughs> but <clears throat> I want to ask a question. Um, is there any uh, uh, product in the market right now that is that have uh, cor a transgenic corn? Yes, uh, we are. Worried. Everybody asks me that when I ever give a public lecture on this. Everybody has this question: Why? Because we want to know what we're eating. Of yes. course. And I would tell you. Everything that is in the supermarket oh. that has corn or soya beans, unless it's labeled oh. as organic, oh. okay. has transgenic. been made out of a transgenic, mm. uh, or at least of a mix. And the likelihood of finding transgenic sequences or proteins, uh, recombinant proteins in these food products is pretty high. I, we are producing this data now, we're, we're sampling in the Mexican markets, tortillerias, uh, supermarkets, uh, some food. We cannot do this because we are not funded for this, but we cannot do it for every product. But we're planning to have a very widespread sample of the types of uh, food that generally contain corn to start with. Um, and which in Mexico are consumed almost every day. Yeah, every, every day. day. Every, every day. I eat tortillas every day, uh, and I think meals. the other day I was in a in a in a meeting in downtown Mexico, and there was a big crowd of people. I asked them who eats torti who eats something made out of corn every day, and everybody raised their hands. Who would like to know if those maize corn derived food that you're eating every day has been derived from a transgenic plant or not and everybody raised their hands. The government should be providing these labels. These labels should be compulsory. That's what American citizens are now yeah. pushing for. for we want to know. No? 
So what I would, I, I would tell you is that I guess that most of the food that is derived from any type of industrial process that involves corn will have recombinant proteins or recombinant DNA. And some other derivatives of these transgenic cultivars which have not been acknowledged and for which we don't even have the assets to test. Why do I say this? Because we now know that uh, transgene will have a different effect in the visible or phenotypical, as we call, traits of a plant or an animal, depending on many issues, depending not only on itself and its function, but on its interactions with many other molecules that are part of these very complex uh, networks of interactions of genetic and non-genetic components that underlie the types of metabolites and the types of traits that are finally expressed in, in a plant. So that's why I'm telling you that there might be some metabolites that are overexpressed in some of these transgenic plants with respect to native plants which have not even been studied. And there are some experiments that suggest that this can be the case. So I'm, I'm, I don't agree that there's any substantial equivalence, because there would be substantial equivalence only if the effects of genes on phenotypes would be independent of each other. Since interactions are important, then we cannot say based on scientific grounds that there is substantial equivalence between a transgenic plant and a non-transgenic plant. And even though they apparently look the same, it's not the same to have a clean piece of meat than a meat that has prions, for example. Even though the meat looks as meat, the prions can be very harmful to human health. We don't know what's going on with known, no, um, pre, no anti, with the, 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 the alterations that transgenesis could produce and that were not anticipated besides the protein, the specific protein, which was being looked for in this uh, transgenesis uh, procedure. So to, to wrap up my answer, I think I'm convinced that food should be labeled and that in Mexico we are eating tortillas made with industrialized flour like minza in many tortillerias and maybe not all of them but there's a high likelihood that some or many of them have some sort of recombinant DNA or protein most of the products, the food products that are sold in supermarkets that are also processed from industrial corn that's imported from the United States or South Africa now, probably has also the presence of recombinant DNA and recombinant proteins. So, so that answered the... But this is very dangerous, it's like a crime against, I mean, universe because, well because there is there is a lot of discussion uh, and and I there is a lot of discussion concerning what are the health issues associated yeah, like about my life. question there is look scientists who are due to conflict of interest or not and and the conflict of interest can come not only from sharing benefits uh, economic benefits from the large industries that are basically promoting and benefiting from producing and commercializing these, these transgenic crops. But this conflict of interest can also arise because some scientists feel that their whole career has been devoted to this type of research because they honestly thought that this would have the answer for human hunger, for a more sustainable agriculture. After two decades of planting these transgenic crops, uh, none of these hopes, no, none of these promises uh, have really uh, become real. I mean, transgenic crops have not increased uh, yield, have not decreased the global use of, 
of agrotoxics, they have implied the use of very toxic uh, <coughs> chemicals like mm -hmm. glyphosate, etc., etc. And nowadays we just have two lines that are also producing resistant pests uh, against, for example, the Bt transgenic mm -hmm. uh, maize or superweeds, super weeds tolerant to the glyphosate in response to the massive planting of Roundup Ready lines. But there, are, so going back to the conflict of interest, there are these scientists who, because their whole career, their prestige, their 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 means of continuing doing science, their their privileges, their etc., their recognition uh, depends on this technology being successful. There is a conflict of interest there. So there are many colleagues here in Mexico. Well, I don't know if many, but some colleagues, which are good scientists, I would say, who are brilliant people, who are convinced that this technology, for one reason or another, will work and is not. And they try to minimize the risks and to ma maximize the benefits. And I think they're not being objective on the real risks they have on those that have been already proven scientifically and on those which are derived from common sense and from scientific knowledge that's already out there. So there's a lot of pressure to turn the load of the demonstration to the society at large, to the citizenship at large, or to the people like ourselves who are worried and who have a more precautionary point of view and, and, and a, a more precautionary uh, perspective on how science should be applied. And so they're leaving this load of, of, of demonstration to all of us rather than applying the precautionary principle. So now they are very um, rigorous in stating until there is not a clear-cut and definitive scientific demonstration that all this food is really harming the population. There is no real reason, although now after two decades we haven't seen any real benefits, to take it out of the market. So concerning your worry, that's what they would say. If you go to the United States, people have been eating this food for two decades and they haven't drop dead. So, uh, yeah. And the problem is that here we have an issue that concern, well, and issues, many issues related to the fact that the health impacts of this transgenic food is not acute. So you don't eat a transgenic plant or food derived from a transgenic plant and you die in the spot. This is very chronic, subclinical, and it takes uh, mid or long term in order to be able to mm -hmm. discern if, if there is any causality between the presence of a transgene, transgene recombinant yeah. protein and a particular illness. Yeah. Besides this, it's going to be almost impossible to establish this causality. Why? Why? Because the food is not labeled. And we don't know, even if it's labeled or not labeled, we're not completely sure of which transgene was used, what type of additional metabolites were produced in that particular transgenic event that were used to produce that food. And we don't keep track of how much transgenic corn versus non-transgenic crop wheat. So that's an issue and also I think that we should, as scientists, be asking, rather than we need a definitely, a definite clear-cut scientific demonstration that something is harmful, which will be very hard to get for many reasons. One of them I already mentioned, and Dr. Schubert, for example, states that it would be really hard to detect if it's this very chronic, so clinical, and it also, the effect depends on the health state of the individual. It will entail amazingly huge 
uh, epidemiological studies, which are generally not done, to be able to demonstrate that there's a clear causal relationship between the uh, eating, eating uh, transgenic food and a particular illness. But based on the information we have from other cases in the food industry, from the story of tobacco, for example, mm -hmm. that it took years, yeah. many years, to convince the regulators mm -hmm. that they should actually label the, the cigarettes and different sources of tobacco, that they are harmful for health, they are still in the market. And in the food, if you read the very, very long labels on the colorings, the, the supplements oh, that are used for the flavorings, yeah. the conservatives, oh, all of these that now are compulsory to, to, to be labeled, it's because they have found some evidence along the years that they might be associated to particular illness. But we cannot get them out of the supermarkets. The economic forces and interests that are behind this we call chatarra. This is junk food. Chatarra. 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 Junk food. It's very, are very strong and it's very hard to go against them. Even though they're harming chronically, subclinically, so slowly, but for sure, the health of everybody. So, I guess we now know about the risk. We know about how little support uh, this cause gets. Uh, I'd like to talk a little about the, the solution. Is there any program that raises, uh, raises awareness about all of this? Is there any solution or advice to give the people? Well, one important advice that is very basic is be informed. Please actively go and get the information. The information is out there. Do not believe the propaganda. Yeah. The propaganda is very strong. So even though this young food, these sweet drinks, or this comida chatarra, it's proven to be very bad for your health. It continues to proliferate and to completely inundar, inundate, how do you say, to, to, spread, to, spread, to spread, to, 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 flood. to flood, to flood, <laughs> thank you, to flood the whole world, no? Yeah. And so this, this is something that some of my, my colleagues use. Why go against transgenics if they're all over the place now? And a lot of people, which is not true because there are only a few countries, but they're being used and planted in greater areas, in larger areas, uh, more and more. Well, this is not a demonstration that they're good. This is not a demonstration that people have asked for them. This is a demonstration of the power of the economic powers, of the, of the economic interests that are behind them. And the power of, of how do you call, of propaganda, of all the media, pu media, media. publicizing media. Uh, all of this as marvelous for your health, etc., etc. So one important thing is to be aware of this, to be conscious about your, what you're eating, to inform yourself, mm -hmm. to promote agroecological uh, food production, which implies not only good quality food for everybody, but sustainable agriculture and what's even probably at the root of all these problems, the, um, the sovereignty to produce and to eat whatever you want to, and it's adequate to your cultural traditions, to the environment in which you, you live. So this uh, food so sovereignty, I think it's at the root of all of this. And if the transgenes in maize produced for industrial means continue to be released and continue to accumulate in our Mexican land races, 
there will be a time not far from now that will deny this possibility of being uh, soberanos, of being sovereign to, to produce and to eat the food that we want to eat. So if we really want to, to protect, I, I mean to, to fight for food sovereignty and everybody in the world, I mean a French, imagine a French without cheese, <laughs> without good cheese or, or whatever they want to eat. Because I guess there are many different types of French, no? But I think this is a, a very basic aspect that will, that should be enough for avoiding the introduction and the accumulation and the cancellation of alternatives. Because this type of technologies, as is happening with the civilization of based on on, on on petrol on hydrocarbon uh, is cancelling for everybody the possibility of having a sustainable world uh, uh, a world that is not contaminated water that is not full of chemicals uh, clean air well this type of technology is the same type of thing i mean it's a technology that spreads without been uh, without containment. I mean, there's no possibility of containing this technology once it's released into the environment, and it cancels other possibilities. Other possibilities like the milpa, which is not just a multi-cropping system, it's a way of life, it's a way of civilization that has proved, proven to be sustainable and to be humane, humanistic and to promote diversity at the biological and at the cultural levels. And this type of transgenic uh, technology can be like la puntilla, you mean the last stab that kills the, the animal. Uh, in this case, that kills the possibility of really bringing back in a contemporary way, in a renewed way, this way of life, hacer milpa, which really entails a completely different way of civilization of, and of sustainable production of, of food in a, in a sovereign and multicultural way. So, you say that the main advice is to look for information, but I would well, yes, yes, I deviated. The main advice is to look for information to get organized because I, we, need, we need organizations of young people. I, that's why I like what you're doing. Uh, we need organizations of scientists. So if you're a scientist, if you're a student, you can start to coordinate with the work that's being done, for example, in the Union of Concerned Scientists. In Mexico, we have this type of union, it's called Ux. Unión de Científicos Comprometidos con la Sociedad. You can do what you're doing. You can uh, collect information and use the, the, the alternative uh, media to let other people know what you learn about the situation. But I think, yes, information, communication, interlinking these different conscious citizens in the world and organization without central and hierarchical type of organizations, this emerging organization that is promoted by this one-to-one -one connection, one-to-one -one communication, and being very, also very, uh, how to say, we say congruentes, we say very, um, how would you translate? We, we, I mean, not say one thing and do another thing. Oh, Be okay. very coherent yeah, between yeah. what you say, what you think, and, and what, you do. In what you do. And but, but also, uh, yes, um, finding synergies, uh, building up these synergies, and being very coherent with these types of values, and, and not, for example, not buying as much as we can, stuff that it's uh, 
it's harming on our health, but it's not only harming our health, but it's also harming the environment. So these embargoes on, on some of these, uh, which is hard, which is hard because what is uh, certified as organic is more expensive. expensive yes. So that's why I don't think in the promotion of certified organic production, but uh, agroecological production with strict food sovereignty. I think that's what we want to promote. And we can start in our backyard, in, in, in our houses, one way or another, urban uh, agriculture, like it's being promoted in some parts of Europe and in Cuba. And also by networking with rural uh, food producers. This is also being done in Europe, who are producing with their own means, which who are um, using agroecological practices, networking with them in order to promote autonomous networks of healthy food production, sustainable food production, and working at the local and at the global with our individual uh, work uh, and activities every day, every day. If it's from science, from science. If it's from student life, from student life. So, and also helping and participating and collaborating with organizations that are finding their way to promote some of these critical discussions and, and to promote, as a scientist, I would call for my colleagues and I, I would address my colleagues and the students that we really need to guarantee or to help that science is really guided once again by knowledge and not by economic values. It's guided by knowledge, by the will to have a better world, both socially and environmentally. So I would say it's very important for scientists and for students to promote this type of discussions and to really make everybody aware of what's going on in the scientific world.